Hello, everybody. Welcome to the FPGA stand up for Open Research Institute for the 21st of June 2022. What we do is we talk about what we've done over the past week, what we are going to do over the next week, what resources we need, and if we have any roadblocks. And so I will hand it over to Paul first to talk about things that have happened uh, from his point of view. And then I'll take it and then I'll turn it over to James. Okay, well, I have nothing to report from the remote lab to start with. That's it's been quiet. Um, we've been working on a bunch of different things, some of which are FPGA related directly and some only tangentially. I've been supporting Michelle on uh, trying to get the, the encoder build integrated with the FPGA. And we got past some roadblocks there where um, we're unable to build because of problems with the, as it turns out, problems with the, uh, the bill we were trying to reproduce. And uh, most of that seems to be behind us now. And we're uh, nearly ready to move on and try to actually do some, push some symbols through there. Uh, I don't want to get into the, too much detail here because I think Michelle probably want to cover that. Um, in other news that we've been working on, it's not directly FPGA related. We've been working on uh, the uplink modulation, uh, starting with the M17 C++ implementation, which is a prototype itself. And uh, we started working on hacking it up to uh, to do a higher bitrate voice, which we're calling opulent voice. This uh, uses the Opus coder instead of the Codec 2 coder for higher voice quality, but it means higher bit rates and all the numerology has to change. So we've done that to the modulator. At least we think so. We haven't been able to test it yet because we're still working on doing it for the demodulator. It turned out to be harder to understand the code. So <clears throat> we went off on a, a side quest to uh, document the existing design of the C++ code for the demodulator so that we'll be able to modify it with better understanding. And that's just about done. There's some text and uh, some diagrams, which Michelle has very helpfully uh, input into the computer so we can see them and uh, not just my chicken scratches on paper. These are in the Google Doc that have been shared on Slack now, if anybody wants to take a look at them. Um, they still need a round of review, but they're pretty much done. Uh, next step will be to go in and start hacking on the demodulator, try to turn it into an opulent voice demodulator, and then make it work. <laughs> Easy. Um, I think that covers the high points. Uh, back to Michelle. Okay, and one other technical thing, a bit of technical progress, is the uh, prototype for the authentication and authorization. Yes, that's also tangentially FPG related. Um, we've been talking for years now about how uh, users to this digital transponder can be filtered by the by policy so that only authorized users are allowed in. Usually that means everybody's allowed in, but maybe a few bad actors are, are excluded. Um, but in some cases, it may mean only a, a certain set of people, maybe people involved in an emergency communication situation aren't allowed to use a transponder. In any case, by being fully digital, we have the opportunity to do more of that than it has ever been done before on an amateur radio satellite. And we're gonna try to take advantage of that. And one of the key insights we had early on was that uh, we need a, a public key infrastructure. Uh, in other words, a, a way of getting trust uh, that we know who is who. And it turns out that's already been done by the ARRL in the logbook of the world. Uh, they have issued a, a RSA certificate to everybody <laughs> who cares to have one in the ham radio community and will continue to do so for uh, QSL purposes. But that puts the crypto in people's hands. They have, a, uh, they have a certificate or they can get one. That's actually been validated by uh, real world procedures. 
in the United States that involves mailing a postcard with a password on it. So you know the person who controls that postal address controls that certificate. Um, anyway, I, I've always been confident that there was a way to take that public key infrastructure and turn it into the primitives we need to do authentication for the satellite. Uh, but I never actually put the, the ends together and made it work. Um, now I have. Uh, there's a, a Jupyter notebook, which I checked in last night, the repo that uses open SSL command line primitives to, to do exactly that. And sure enough, it's possible. Uh, it doesn't take uh, any special cooperation from ARRL or Logbook of the World. The certificates that you need to do that are, are out there in public on purpose and not just leaked or anything. And uh, I showed how to do the steps that are going to be necessary. The next, there's still lots of details to be fleshed out of, I mean, the protocol, how it's exactly going to work, but the basic stuff is there and does do what, what we expected it to do. So that's a step forward. Yeah, thank you. We'll, uh, we're planning to have a poster session presentation at the RF Village at DEF CON in August. And hopefully, uh, since this village, RF Village, is, is dedicated to uh, security uh, for radio frequency work, and this is a, a security-related issue, we're hoping to get a lot of eyeballs on it and a, a good solid review from the community. And um, you know, even if we if we don't have anything further than what we have today, I think the the Jupyter notebook and a and a poster will be a, a good a good thing to put in front. Uh, but we still have quite a bit of time, so hoping to get um, maybe uh, a more of a, a demonstration going. So it's something we're looking forward to. And you can see this in the the opulent voice uh, protocol that there is a uh, part of the protocol where if you're challenged for authentication that you send a special packet and we're thinking um, if, if for the for the initial uh, uplink protocol we're just looking at putting uh, opus frames at the physical layer but you can see from the document that there's multiple layers um, and what that means is, is since there's there's a, a UDP layer an ethernet ethernet UDP and then RTC or RTP sorry um, that the the replies for the authentication challenge would go to a particular uh, port or address. Um, and so that reduces the need for, for using it bits in the physical layer header. Uh, so all of this stuff feeds into the implementation for the, for the FPGA at the, uh, uh, in the payload. Um, and all, all this is active discussion. So if you're interested, if you're listening to this and interested, then uh, join us on Slack or uh, join the mailing list and, and we'll be regularly posting updates pretty much every week. OK, cool. Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, one more sure. point to make about that. The, the primitives are, are well known, well vetted. It's what everybody uses on the web. Open SSL is where the crypto comes from. Um, so that's not in question. The question is the protocols and procedures. It's very easy to make us uh, accidentally put a backdoor or make us screw up in the protocols. And so we're hoping to get enough detail into onto our poster that that the experienced security people at DEFCON will be able to look at it and say, oh, you did this regular, this very common mistake. You need to fix this um, before it gets encoded into standard. Uh, Every seems to be having trouble getting into the meeting here. So you might want to check the, uh -oh. there's a waiting room. No, there isn't. I turned it off. I don't see him. Okay. He's wonder, on. I wonder if he's using a slide complaining. Uh oh. Okay, let me see what I can do. Scrolling down. Let's pass it over to James while we're trying yeah. to debug that. Yeah, let's go ahead. Go ahead, James. You have the floor. All right. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm James Kilo Juliet Seven Kilo Delta Echo. I'm the technician overlooking ORI Remote Lab South. Uh, there's currently not too much to report back from our remote lab down here, and we're still just doing some general work, getting the barn together, and we're getting uh more quotes on what we're going to be doing for some of the more major repairs to the facility that's going to eventually house all of the primary areas of our, of our lab equipment down here. Um, recently, the board member, Keith, who, who is here, went on a trip, and so I do believe that uh, Paul Michelle, you'll be seeing him sometime soon within the next week or so in person. 
and that'll be nice. Uh, it's true. Yeah, all very, get together. very soon. Just a couple of hours. Awesome. So yeah. Um, otherwise, things have been pretty calm here. Weather's been calm and good. And things have been nice. No issues to report. No current roadblocks, at least. No good. Yeah, we should should be able to work through a lot of uh, stuff for remote lab South development um, while while Keith is here in person. So looking forward to that. Again, yeah, that's pretty much all I had. Okay, thank you. All right, Anshul, you have the floor. Uh, nothing much to report this week. Um, I've been involved in some documentation work for applying for grants and expression of interest. We'll continue to do so for next week. Uh, apart from that, I uh, had a discussion with Leonard. He has suggested some way that we can write Python script and interact with IO drivers. Uh, that can be the way forward to test the system uh, to test the encoder. But yeah, that's that's the plan. I need to uh, work on this and test it out. Apart from that, um, I need uh, Michelle. You have identified few files that are missing that needs to be added, so I will add it to that directory um, on Chococat and will upload them so that anyone can use it and build our module. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I'll I'll give a brief report about the integration effort. Uh, what Anshul has set up is a repository that pulls in the analog devices reference design for the ZC706 and ADRV9371, and also stitches in the encoder from uh, Swato and others. And this uh, hadn't been working for me. And so what we did over the past, um, essentially over the past weekend was to really dig in and, and found out that there were some, some missing files and that the um, oh, there's some hard-coded paths. Uh, so I think that once this gets cleaned up, we're going to test it thoroughly, and then we're going to advertise this uh, much more widely to show that the uh, this IP block is is useful for the larger FPGAs. This is the same encoder that Everest recently demonstrated at Friedrichshafen for uh, over the uh, on the Pluto that works on the Pluto. Uh, that also uses a reference design from from analog devices. It turns out that that uh, leveraging the reference design has has been good for us. Uh, some other information about the design. Uh, this is the encoder, which is the transmitter side on the downlink uh, for the payload. The there is some some news for the decoder, which would be on the ground station, and we do have some decoder work from Amit Anon that's been in our repository for a bit and a uh, research institute uh, R&D firm was interested in uh, making this work better. And so they have uh, engaged Amit to help them uh, develop it further and fix some things that were a little bit fragile about it. Uh, the good news is that this is all going to be done open source and will be donated back. So we'll have a matching decoder. And that will, of course, need some some work from from us uh, to 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 test out and to to publicize. But that's uh, really good news. So it brings the decoder along uh, faster than I thought it would go. Um, another thing that lets us do as a group is that our our newest volunteer uh, Ken Easton will be able to work on the scheduler. And I know that. Uh, Anshul and a few other people were interested in working on the scheduler. So this is kind of the heart of the, the multiplexer in the payload. This would be on a satellite or on a ground sat terrestrial um, payload. And what it does is decides which baseband frame gets sent to the encoder next. And that's a big deal because we have adaptive coding and modulation. So we have to make decisions on what the baseband frame looks like based on the, the quality of the links from the, the payload down to the earth. And it also brings up quality of service, which is something that we want to support. So if you need a low latency link, uh, for example, if you're, you're all into voice, you don't really care about uh, maybe missed packets as much as you care about getting things delivered on time. And that is something that the scheduler is going to handle. So this, uh, Ken and others have advised that this is 
this really needs to be in essentially in firmware. This is a software sort of sort of deal. Um, so probably not HDL unless we uh, decide to go ahead and do it in HDL, but it, this really belongs uh, in the firmware side. So that effort has started with at least some whiteboarding and some some talking about and, and some volunteerism. Uh, what we'll need to do is is start some some real documentation and make some decisions and it will start out pretty simple, uh, essentially like a FIFO and then more control plane and more uh, uh, functionality will be added. Uh, so you can sort of see things coming together, the encoder on the downlink transmitting the signal down to a decoder waiting in the ground and uh, the scheduler deciding what needs to be sent and what it looks like, and then uh, the uplink um, streams, uh, frequency division, multiple access streams that are our baseline is opulent voice to use that protocol. Um, and so the part that that is least completed, um, but actually does have some some open source code is the the receiver uplink receiver, uh, and and that. Uh, we envision being um, a, a polyphase channelizer, a polyphase filter bank or channelizer uh, working in HDL to, to sort things out. So we do have a pretty good head start here with some, some working code that we've demonstrated before. In 2019, we took this polyphase channelizer from Theseus cores and we ran it uh, on a, a USRP X310 at, at DEF CON and it, we did eight channels. Now we're going to need a lot more than eight channels. So what we need to do is look really hard at the Theseus cores HDL, which is targeting a, a zinc processor, uh, the zinc, I think it's a 7045 on the, the X310 and go ahead and target like the ZC706. So that that part is uh, in our near future and we'll be we'll be looking hard at that. And, and so you can sort of see the entire um, arc of the, the of the project coming together. There's still a whole lot to do, but just over the past few weeks, we've we've come a, a long way, and that is where we're we're aiming uh, for the for the future. So over the next week, whatever we can get done on any of this is what we'll be doing, and lots of lots of things going on and tests being made. I think the the impediment of being able to feed the encoder. Um, with BB frames, that's that's getting solved. I think we're getting a better and better idea of how to do that um, in on the processor side of the zinc. All right, that's it. Are there? Let's see. Uh, Everest, are you able to to talk and hear us? You have the floor if you can. Okay, I don't know if. Oh yeah, yeah. I can hear you. You sound good. Hello, congratulations on your presentation at Friedrichshafen, okay. and you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So sorry, um, I just set up the application because the web browser uh, doesn't work. So I miss all the uh, all the news uh, you've done. So just a quick update of what I did is um, um, building the firmware of the Pluto SDR. Um, so there is a GitHub uh, repository right now, which includes the, uh, the design of uh, the Pluto with the DBS2 encoder. Um, so uh, the firmware is there. There is some binary already in the firmware in order to, uh, uh, to use the DBS2 encoder. And uh, the next step is now to um, uh, publish the source code of that uh, in order to uh, to have a better uh, way of uh, contribution and uh, in order to adapt it to uh, the the other uh, project uh, with the ZC06. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, so uh, try to help other to uh, adapt uh, on another platform uh, than the Pluto. But uh, yeah, so I try to uh, to do that uh, this week, and uh, then we can test all that 
um, and uh, be ready for uh, the this DEFCON demo. Back to you. Thank you so much. All right, any other questions or comments or needs or, or roadblocks? Uh, one thing, Everest, uh, so, so the binary you mentioned about how to use this uh, encoder, it, it's basically a testing binary or it's, what is it? Can you explain a bit? Yeah, uh, yeah, so right now uh, there is some binary. Uh, so it is hard coded for the IO for the Pluto. So it shouldn't, uh, I don't think it works directly uh, for another platform. That's why I try to uh, uh, publish it. And then you can just uh, modify the IO number uh, mainly. And uh, so the binary are on the overlay of the build root. Um, you can try to, well, I, I didn't write uh, the documentation how to, uh, uh, to use it. And uh, I know that I have to do that, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, that's fine, that's fine. So uh, it, it's a kind of, yeah app that will uh, send the packets and uh, it will send the packets to DVB encoder and then uh, get the radio out. So yeah, if you can add some documentation and when you are ready, uh, upload the source code and then I can use it and modify it as per the 3706. Yeah, sure. That's, that's the plan for the week. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That will be really helpful. <laughs> Okay, any other comments or questions before we close for the week? All right, thank you everybody. There's plenty going on and uh, please uh, check in on Slack. And um, thank you so much for all of the hard work. It's deeply appreciated and we're making good progress. Thanks to you. All right, see you soon. Okay, bye. Thank <laughs> you.